Hey everyone, and welcome to the After Effects Classroom project. So on my channel, I already have a Photoshop classroom that I did for my students, and now we're jumping to the next step, which is the After Effects Classroom project. Now, for After Effects, you have to understand, first of all, what it is. It's a post-production, compositing, and video editing software. So what do these words mean? Post-production means that when a video is being shot, by directors or for a commercial or for a movie or anything like that. After Effects' job is to basically take that video and fix it up, edit it, cut it, create more effects such as green screens and smoke and fire and stuff like that. So mainly this is what After Effects is used for in the industry. To create simple animations, 2D or 3D animations, plus compositing, so creating new colors, changing the colors, the mood, the aspect, green screening, and to be able to create small little video deformations and everything like that. So to start with After Effects, it's in the same Adobe family. Here I have Adobe uh, CC 2020, so Creative Cloud 2020. Uh, I'm going to be explaining pretty much in this classroom for any version of, photo of After Effects. I'm not going to be using specific tools that correlate with the specific version of After Effects. So anybody can just use it and follow my tutorials to be able to understand what's going on. So let's get going here. First of all, similar to Photoshop, you have to create a new page to start working on After Effects. So in Photoshop, it's called a new page. Here, it's called a new composition. The composition will have a few different settings from a normal 2D page, and we're going to go through them slowly. So first of all, to start in After Effects, you have to understand that wherever I click on the user interface, it will highlight in blue. So let's discuss what these do. On the left side, so over here, this is called my project tab. So inside of projects, you will have all the files, videos, compositions in a list that you can just constantly use, bring into the composition or not. So it's like a file system that you keep all of your work safe and neat and organized. Uh, in the middle, right here, this is the main work area. It's called the composition. So this is where the pictures and everything will go. On the bottom, you have two little separate pieces. On the left side of the bottom, so the bottom left, you have your layer system, so layer name, and all the layers will go here, just like in Photoshop. And on the right side, right here, I have the timeline. Since we're going to be working with videos, you have to understand that you need to have a specific time. So you, be, you have to manipulate the time for the video itself. On the right, we have a few little things like presets and effects and how to change the typography of your text or the alignment and the audio, the information of pictures and stuff like that. So many things can go on the right side, but we're going to focus mainly here. And on the top, I have my toolbar. So I have the file, edit and everything. And I have my tools that don't change too much depending on what tool you are using. So if I'm using my pen tool to select, if I'm using a shape tool, these might change a little bit. They might get added on. But other than that, these are the standard tools that you're going to be constantly using. So starting from here, you have your selection tool or V. This is used for universal movement and changing the layers and everything. You have your pan or hand tool. This allows you to manipulate or move the scene a little bit. Your zoom tool, rotate tool, unified camera tool, which we're not going to be talking about anytime soon. Your pan behind anchor point tool. This is to be able to move the axis of rotation or the point of rotation of a specific layer, which we'll go through it later on. My ellipse tool or shape tool in general, same as Photoshop. You create rectangles, circles, ellipses, stars, stuff like that. My pen tool, which can be used for selection or drawing out lines. Text tool, which is just your normal typography tool. My brush tool to be able to paint. My clone stamp tool, which is able to just take a specific position on a layer and copy it somewhere else. And here we have the eraser tool. The roto brush or rotoscoping brush, which is a very advanced method of removing subjects from a scene and a video mainly. So if you have, for example, character animating in a scene or talking and you want to remove the background, the rotoscoping tool allows you to select the characters as they're moving uh, throughout the video and removes the background. And this is called the pin tool or the puppet position pin tool, which is allowing you to animate a certain character or uh, a scene or a layer. You're able to put pins and you can move them around to your liking. I'm not going to talk about any of these because these tools are brand new to CSC 2020 or 2017. I think they started adding these tools, so I'm not going to go through them for the preservation of the version. So let's get started here. I need to create a new composition. So two ways I can go to composition here on the top, 
new composition or control N or I can just right click on the project seen right here in the gray area and say new composition now this will open settings similar to if you're creating a new page in Photoshop but we're going to talk about a few other settings that are very important for videographers and compositors so I have my normal width and height this is my resolution so to understand what the resolution is it's the size of your screen or image that's going to be fitting inside of there so typically 1920 by 1080 is an HD so here we have presets very important to understand the presets I have NTSC presets pile presets HD presets and then UHD presets so categories you can see how they're divided you have the UHD so 4k displays you have the HDs, then you have the PAL and the NTSC. What differs between them is two things, the resolution and the frame rates. So NTSCs, the format is typically used in European TVs and um, American TVs. So they have a very specific resolution and a very specific frame rate, which I'm going to explain frame rate in a second. PAL is usually used for Arab countries or Asian countries and a few African countries. Okay, so typical Africa, Asia, and Arab countries. All right. So also they have a different resolution from NTSC and a different frame rate from NTSC. This is why sometimes when you live in an Asian country and you look at a actual movie from America that is placed on the local TV or local channels, not the satellite channels, but the local channels on your TV, uh, you will notice black bars on the bottom or on the bottom uh, sorry on the bottom and on the top uh, and these black bars indicate that they are trying to scale down the resolution that they used for their movies into the resolution that is fitting for your tv or for your local channel resolution so not that important because most of the cases now in tvs we're using hd so that's fine hd typical resolution ranges around 1080 1920 or 1280 720 and if you notice here, I get small little numbers next to them, like 29.97, 25, 29.97, 25, all of those numbers. Here it's like 24. So what do these numbers mean? Those are the frame rates. For every second of video, so how does a video, how, how do you shoot a video? Basically, the camera is capturing every single frame or a picture, 24 pictures or 25 pictures or 30 pictures or 60 pictures will make one second of your video. To understand blatantly, if I'm taking a video of a bird flying for, let's say, two seconds, so in those, these two seconds, my video is shooting 24 frames per second. So I'm getting an image, 24 images to create one second of my video. So I can see the bird basically in stop motion. So bird's wings flapping. So Boom, one picture, a second picture after that, a, second, a third picture, and so on and so forth to create 25 pictures, which will give me one second. So I'm using two seconds here. It's going to be 50 frames per second. So 50 images to create my video of two seconds. Those are frame rates. That's how the FPS works inside of videos. So here you have, to describe it, I have an HD version, which is a 1280 by 720 resolution, and it's working at 30 frames per second. Okay? So... I typically use HDTV 1080 at 30 frames per second or 25 frames. So we're going to go 25 here. So if you notice, once I click it, it's over here on the presets. And it's telling me my width and my height is 1920 by 1080. Correct. If I change to a PAL, it will go 720 by 576 with 25 frame rates. Let's go back to HD, HDTV 25. It's a 1920 by 1080, 25 frame rates. Now, a few things you never touch. For me, I never touch the square pixels. I keep it square. This will change the actual frame rate and aspect ratio of your scene or resolution, which I don't want to do. I keep my resolution to full. I have my start time and my duration. So right here, I have my milliseconds. So the first two zeros are milliseconds. The next twos are seconds. So this is 30 second video, for an example. Here, I have my minutes. And the last zero is my hours. And I can change the background color if I choose to. I'm going to keep it white. And I just press OK. Now I can name this to, let's call it, main comp as a main composition. And say OK. First thing that will happen is I have on my project the main composition. And on the top, I can see it's a 1920 by 1080, 30 second video at 25 frames per second. Perfect. So right here, 
I have my time. So since it's a 30 second video, there it is, 30 seconds. So if you want to calculate how many frames I have right now in my 30 second video from 0 to 30, to calculate this, all you do is I have 25 frames per second. I have 30 seconds here. So you just multiply them together and you get the amount of frames, which is going to be, uh, I'm not going to calculate actually now, but let's just pull it out very quickly. So I got 25 times 30 seconds. That's 750 frames in total. So all of these, I have 750 frames. To understand what I'm talking about specifically, so if I press Control Alt and I scroll in to this area, you notice that the seconds are getting smaller. So here I had 0, 2, 4, 6. I scroll in once, I have now. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 seconds. I scroll in one more time. It stays. One more time, I get frames. So here I have 0. 5 frames, 10 frames, 15 frames, 20 frames, 25 frames is a second. So I get 01.00F. So that's 25 frames or one second. If I zoom in more, one more time, one more time, I get frame by frame. So 0, 1 frame, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that's by clicking Control, Alt, and scroll wheel in and out of this. Or what I can do is just click on the bottom here. Zoom into frame level or out to entire comp. So here I can just scale this or down. Or if you want to, over here on the right side, I have a small little blue dot right here, if you see it, right here where my cursor is. And I can just scale this down to scale down the time as I please. Okay? So very useful little tools. Now, I need to be able to import images into my scene or videos if I want to, to be able to start working. So how do I do that? I can go in the project file right here, in the project scene, in the gray area, double click, and I'm able to get any picture or video that I choose. So I'm going to get the picture of, let's say this man, import. And over here, of course, I get a few things. One, when I click on the image, I get what kind of image it is. It's a JPEG, imported JPEG with 151 kilobytes of size. And in, over here, I have the resolution, so 2,247 by 1,500 and millions of colors. Perfect. So I need to get this into my composition. All I do is click on the man, click and drag into my scene, and release my mouse, and I get this. Now, two things will happen. When this is placed on my composition, first of all, of course, you can scale it any way you want. So to uniformly scale, I have to press Shift, it will uniformly scale. To move it, of course, you press your V on your keyboard or this tool right here, the selection tool, and you're able to move wherever you want this picture to be. So shift, so I can just scale it down a little bit. There we go. Two things will happen once you import a video, an image, or anything inside of your scene or composition. One, I get a layer right here. In my layer system, I get the man JPEG layer. And this is where most of the work will happen how you're going to be animating, how you're going to move things. Everything happens here in the layers. And second, I get this bar. So this bar is that the fact it's a layer that has a bar from 0 to 30 seconds. So this image is being seen into my composition for 30 seconds in total. If I click on this, um, let's call it the line, the timeline, if I click on it and I move it, it's not going to do anything because I have no animations, but it's able to see everything. If I move this bar to the left, so by clicking and dragging it to the left or to the right, you will notice that if I go to 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, I'm almost at 14, it cuts away from here. If I move to 14, I will see the background of my main composition, which was white. So it disappears. The layers have a specific dimension, if you will. So this bar right here, if you see the line, it will always point to the layer it sees first. Same as in Photoshop, the top layer is always priority. Okay, so let's import another picture here. Add it up and let me just scale it up. So it's a very bad resolution image. It's a very small resolution image, so I'm gonna grab another one. I'm gonna get uh, this iPhone, a bit better, yes. Okay. So, first of all, priority. Where's the priority happening? This bar is only seeing, only touching, the first layer it's touching is the iPhone. So the man will never be shown. 
if I take the man and I place him on top, so by clicking and dragging on top of the iPhone, now I'm able to see only the man. But since I cut away or I move this layer to the side, I'll be able to see the iPhone by the 12th second. So I'm rolling around my animation, everything is good, and then suddenly I come here. What is the line going to touch first? It's going to touch the iPhone. This is empty space. Boop, it's touching this. So let me change this color so you can understand a little bit better to a peach. There we go. So this color is different than this color now. So it's going around. It's seeing the blue, 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 and then it sees the orange. OK, that's how you can differentiate between layers. Now, instead of moving it this way, what I can do is something called cutting the layer or editing the layer. So I place it back to normal. Now, both layers are the same dimension. If I want to cut, let's say at six seconds, I want this man, this entire layer to be cut right there. So I press Alt bracket. Let me type it for you guys. It's Alt bracket on the keyboard or Alt and this bracket. So there you have it. These will allow you These will allow you to cut the actual layer. So here, I'm going to press on the six seconds. Right here, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to click on the layer so my layer is activated. Yes, perfect. I'm going to press on Alt and the right bracket. Why? Because I want to cut from the right to the left. So right bracket will cut away everything from the right to the point where the time line is at. Control Z to undo. If I want to cut from zero to six, Alt, left bracket, it will cut that piece. All right. If you made a mistake, you can always just click here on the layer itself. You can notice that I get this little icon. So click and drag, and I'm able to reform the entire layer if you ever feel like you messed up the cut. All right. So this was a very basic introduction to After Effects and how it works and how the layer system works. So in the next video, I'm going to go a bit about how to start animating. Right. So here I'm going to show you a bit more of how to simply animate something and then we're going to jump into more advanced in the next video. So let's go over very simple animations. Let's say I would like this picture to go from the right side of the frame, so like right here, and just slowly animate in and go to the other side like so. So to understand that feature, you have to understand two things. Keyframes, intervals. How does this work together? Now, keyframes are where is the entire picture or scene being held? So to understand a little bit better, I'm going to create a small little introduction to animation. Animation starts with something called a storyboard. Somebody gets an idea for a story, which is, let's say, a movie, and they want to create it. The first thing you do, so let me remove all of this. The first thing they do is create a storyboard, which is by drawing it out, they create a story. So here, my story is going to be, I want a bouncing ball. So how do they create this? They create lines. Sorry. Oh god, my scratch disk is full, seriously? One second, I'll be right with you. OK, and we are back. Sorry, I just had to delete a few things on my desktop to be able to allocate some space. So. Still not enough. I'll be right back. And we're back. Sorry about that. So they basically create a grid system just like so. And they say, for an example, my story, I have a sphere, a ball. So I would like here around, let's say, the first frame. One, I have a ball that is in midair. Two, the ball will hit the floor. Sorry, let me just make it a bit better. Three, we'll go back up. Four, back down. Five back up. Okay. So the story is basically that the ball is just going to keep bouncing up and down. Perfect. So that's my storyboard. I know what kind of animation I would like to do. Now, to understand what keyframes are. So keyframes are the first pieces of animation you have to do. So I know that a ball, for an example, when it's bouncing, it has to have a bit of a squash or stretch as it falls on the floor. As it touches the floor, gravity is technically hitting it, and it has to kind of stretch and flex in a sense. So 
I can't create that because first of all, those are the intervals. My keyframes are up, down, up, down. So that's my basic of animation. So in my timeline, like so, I'm going to go zero, two seconds, oh, sorry, four, six, eight. So at zero seconds, my ball is up. So that's a key. It looks like a diamond. I can maybe draw a better diamond than that. There we go. It's a diamond. So the diamond indicates that in this location, at this time, so at zero, in this location, the ball is here. At two, the ball will be on the floor. So on the bottom, so that's another keyframe. So what I'm doing is creating a key. The key is basically like saved information. Inside of it, there is the information where the ball is at at this time. And at zero seconds, it's up. At two seconds, it's down. Four, it's going to be up again. Down, up. OK, so all of these are going to be keys. And you're going to see them now in After Effects. So those are my keyframes. Now, to understand intervals, they're made to beautify the animation or make it look real. So a ball going up and down, up and down, it's not going to look good. It's just going to look very generic and stupid. So if you have intervals, that's where, with the intervals, you start squashing and stretching the ball to give you that realistic effect of physics. And that's our job as animators, is to simulate physics or fake physics in a 2D environment where it's not supposed to be there. And we have to try to get the animation looking exactly right like in real life. And that's the point. So here, let me just delete this picture. We don't need it. We don't need this. We don't need this. We don't need this. What I'm going to do here is create a shape. So from here, ellipse tool, I'm going to make it red. There we go. And I'm just going to click and drag, create this little sphere. Now, something very important about creating a sphere or any kind of layer inside of After Effects, since I know that my ball is going to squash only on impact, I'm going to put my Point of rotation using this tool, the Y tool on your keyboard. And if you notice here, this crosshair is where this object will rotate. So I'm going to put it on the bottom. By pressing on the Y tool, I can just change its position to the bottom. So this is going to be here. Step number one. At zero, I said that the ball is on the top. So to open up my animations to be able to start animating, I have here my shape layer, so we're going to call it ball. There we go. And on the left side of this layer, all the layers have this little drop down menu right here, this little arrow. So the transforms, all the layers have a transform, which is the anchor point, which I'm not going to talk about now. It's just to change the, the point of rotation. Position, where is the ball transforms or position through the composition. The scale, so the size, the rotation, so the angle rotation of the actual object. And the opacity, is it visible or invisible? In After Effects, every single stopwatch or every single thing with a stopwatch can be animated. So here what I'm going to do first is create my keyframes for my position. So to start animating, I have to click on the stopwatch. There we go, it's highlighted. And second, you notice here I have a key. This key, what it's telling the software is that at zero seconds, the ball is at X and Y position. 888X, 428Y. It's saved inside of this little thing, this little key. So at two seconds, I'm going to just move this, this, draw, this timeline to two seconds and just click and drag all the way down the ball. I has, uh, sorry, it has a new keyframe, and this keyframe is telling the software at two seconds, the ball is at this X and this Y position. Four, move back up. Six, go back down. Eight, go back up, and we're done with the animation. That is our, there we go, up, down, up, down, up. Perfect. So, these are my keyframes right here. Now, if I press play by pressing space on my keyboard, the animation is very generic, it's very stupid, it's very slow, but it doesn't really matter because next comes the intervals where you're going to make this animation realistic. And that's the point. So what I'm going to do here is start animating the ball. But first thing, I need to understand the first interval that I'm going to be creating, which is what? I need the ball if I'm going to be able to create this squashing and flexing animation, I need the ball to stay on the floor for a little bit longer. 
So if I notice zero, two, it's hitting the floor. And as soon as it hits the floor, it goes back up. I can't have that if I'm going to be squashing and stretching it. So I need the ball to stay on the floor for a few more seconds, for at least one more second. How do I do that? This keyframe specifically at two seconds is already on the floor. So I can press Control C on my keyboard, move a little bit my time, press Control V to copy this frame and this frame. They're equal, they're exactly the same. So what's happening here in the software? Let me just move, move these a bit further away. So it comes to zero. The animation is starting. The ball is falling down. At two seconds, it stops and it stays on the floor for this amount of duration. Since here I have a keyframe telling the software the ball is at this X and Y. And also during that time, it's also at X and Y. So between these two frames, for one second, the ball is staying in the same place, which is the point. So now I can start squashing the animation down. So here in my scale, I'm going to go here to two seconds, click on the scale, remove this link. If I keep this link on, the X and Y scaling will be uniform. I don't want that. I want to remove it. I'm going to go here. It's going down. As soon as it hits the floor, I'm going to squash it. So lower down. So you can see the ball is squishing down. So let me just zoom out a bit. And then on release, so as it's going back up, I'm going to release to go back to 100, giving you this animation. So it's falling, it squashes, it goes back up and goes back to the sky. Same thing here. We're going to go back to this keyframe. I need it to stay on the floor for a few more seconds. So Control C. So I have it clicked on. Control C. Move a bit forward. Control V. That way the ball stays on the floor a bit longer. Move this a bit to the side. So here I'm going to create a new keyframe. So the scale, for me to be able to click on and create a new keyframe with these exact specification, I just click here. And you notice the key is on. Move forward a bit. Squash it down. There you go. So you can see with me. And as it's moving back up, which is around here, I'm going to release this to 100, giving you this animation. It goes down, squash, goes back up, release. Good. Goes back down, squash, goes back up, release. Perfect. So the squashing and the stops of the position are called intervals. So my keyframes are at 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. Those are the keyframes for the actual animation for the up, down, up, down. The rest is all intervals. It made the animation more realistic. So I hope you followed along so far because the next video is going to go a bit more into details about keyframes and how to do create intervals. And I would like to thank you so much for watching. If you like the content, please like, subscribe and comment on my YouTube channel. And I'll be seeing you in the next video. Thanks, guys. Bye.